This video is about the early life of American actress Tallulah Bankhead, as remembered by her in her 1952 autobiography. I was inspired to make this video because I enjoy looking at photos of Tallulah Bankhead. She has a very unique look, which was attempted to be imitated by various other actresses, including Betty Davis in The Little Foxes, but I don't know if anybody was ever able to capture the beauty of this Southern classic. Tallulah Bankhead was born in Alabama and was personal friends with Zelda Fitzgerald, the wife of F. Scott Fitzgerald. Tallulah writes, I never knew my mother. She survived my birth by but three weeks. Her death was brought about by complications arising from my birth, but I never had feelings of guilt, even when old enough to be aware of the association of the two events. From the start, I was too pampered by Daddy, by Aunt Marie and Aunt Louise, by my grandmother and grandfather, to brood over the loss of a mother I could not remember. Until her death, grandmother was mama to me. My mother, Adelaide Eugenia Sledge, was a Southern belle, and by all evidence, written, oral, and photographic, an astonishing beauty. Stark Young, critic and Southern novelist, wrote she was a creature out of the Arabian Nights. As beautiful as Ada Sledge, for two generations, was the highest tribute that could be paid a woman in the South, he said. He first saw her at a ball in a private home. Surrounded by eager young men, she was weaving patterns with her fan in the manner of a Madame du Barry. Mother was 13, Mr. Young was 7, and peeking from a stairway. Mother's grandfather was very wealthy. He had a racetrack on his plantation, was president of the Cotton Exchange, and thought nothing of betting $10,000 on one of his fighting cocks, of losing thousands when cotton prices ran counter to his judgment. My knowledge of mother's family is sketchy. Daddy used to say he had to slave for two years to pay for our baby clothes, sisters and mine. It was a reflection of mother's upbringing that these were heavy with lace. But mother was more than a great beauty. She was high-spirited, gay, and a born actress. When I was playing in the skin of our teeth, a distinguished-looking woman came to my dressing room after a performance. She had gone to school with mother. What this stranger was to say warmed me. Your mother was the most beautiful thing that ever lived. Many people have said you get your acting talent from your father, but I disagree. I was at school with Ada Eugenia and I knew Will well. I have followed his career, the career of your father. You inherited your talent from your mother. Did you know that she could faint on cue? Once she had a crush on a young doctor. Whenever she saw him approaching, she would feign a swoon, bring him galloping across the campus. She had golden hair, dark brown eyes, and pearl white skin. Told that she looked wonderful in black, she appeared in chapel in widow's weeds, prayer book under her arm the following Sunday. Mother attended Salem College in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Returning home from summer vacation, she soon had all the girls in town arranged in Grecian friezes or loping across lawns in classic dances. I treasure another memory of her, set down in a letter from a stranger. She wrote, I used to know your mother. I'll never forget her riding side saddle in a brown habit lined with red taffeta, a black tricorn hat atop her head. At a ball, we'd all wait in the cloakroom until your mother arrived just to admire her. Though we were all her age, none of us was jealous of her beauty. Here's a tribute from another who knew her. If Tallulah's as mad as a hatter, she came by it honestly. So was her mother. Before her marriage to Daddy, she said, Mother had gone to Paris, rejoiced in its luxuries, then returned to Como, Mississippi, with trunks full of Worth clothes. Como was a whistle stop. Was she dismayed because she had no arena worthy of her wardrobe? Not a bit. Radiant in a low-cut gown, she would take off down a dirt road, a basket on her arm, shopping. With Daddy and Mother, it was a case of love at first sight. Mother was engaged to a rich Virginia planter. Following the protocol of that day, she went to visit one of her prospective bridesmaids in Huntsville, Alabama. There she met Daddy, then a young lawyer. With that, she was through with the rich young planter. She broke off the engagement to the great annoyance of her family. Three months later, she married Daddy. At my home in Bedford Hills, I have two priceless possessions, my Augustus John portrait and my father's journal. Daddy's reflections and observations are sporadic. Frequently, he skips a year or more. 
Here is an entry dated January 31st, 1904. Six years have flown and have flown almost with fury since last I wrote. The scene then was New York City, the writer a young struggler in the malls of a stupendous city, and his years were far fewer than now. Today I write again in Huntsville, placid, tender old town in the shadow of the hills, and I am older far than they and sadder. This is my wedding anniversary. Four years ago, I took to my heart and to my name the tenderest and the most beautiful girl the golden sunlight of heaven ever curtsied to and caressing. Today, out of Maple Hill Cemetery, sleeping beneath a white shaft of marble, not as purely white as her soul, but meant to typify it, sleeps that blessed dust dearer to me than the ruddy drops that visit this sad heart, my blessed Jean. I have often since that greatest tragedy of my life had a purpose to write of her, of our courtship, our joyful married life, of my struggles and her sacrifices, of the coming of the babies and of the coming of the gray angel to my home, my grief, and all the bittersweet days that came and went, but I have not been able to find the spirit or the vein in which to set it down. I am aware that my children will soon begin to make inquiries about their mother, of how she lived and loved and died, as they should and as I want them to, but I know how my heart and my speech shall fail me when the time comes, how my eyes will brine with ever too ready tears and my throat throb with a choking pain that ever is attendant upon that cruel retrospection. They will be able to know how beautiful she was by the pictures I have of her and yet which are so impotent to give an idea of her glorious coloring, the tenderness and yet the spirit of her brown eyes, the beauty of her curls, the fair and rosy skin, her expression when animated or in conversation. I met her very casually one night at the McGee Hotel in Huntsville while she was here on a shopping expedition from Portland. She afterwards told me she had come to buy her apparel in which to marry another man. Jessie Gilchrist and Nanette DuBose were her companions. Alas, poor Nanette, she too has gone in the same heroic way as my little girl. It was truly a case of love at first sight. I continued my attentions after she went back to Aunt Alice's at Cortland, and I often went down there on Sundays to see her. In fact, on the old front porch at Summerwood, I made my first declaration of love, of a true love, that still lives beyond the tomb and beyond the stars. I have preserved for our babies our love letters, mine to her and hers to me. If they should ever read them, I hope and believe that they will feel and believe ours was a love of tenderest trust and consuming affection. Those letters tell the story of our courtship with a tenderer diction than I now can write. For then joy and beautiful anticipations ran my pen. While now I write in the shadow of the loss, while choked with the anguish of absence. The wedding took place in Memphis, on Jefferson Street. It was beautiful, the flowers, the dazzling lights, the joyous guests, the dreamful and soulful music, and far and above the beauty of the environments was the matchless beauty of my bride. I have her wedding gown. She wore it only once. I have never had the courage to look upon its silken folds since she went away to God. Ornate, you say? Flowery, wordy? Echo of a more leisurely age? True. But the first time I read it, it broke my heart. It still does. I was christened beside my mother's casket, immediately thereafter packed off with sister to Aunt Mary's home in Montgomery. For the next 15 years, we led a gypsy existence. When Congress was adjourned, Daddy, sister, and I lived with grandfather and grandmother at their home in Jasper. Daddy lived there from the time of mother's death death until he was elected to the House of Representatives in 1916. This cues me into an anecdote pointing up the long arm of coincidence. Shortly after the end of the Spanish-American War, Granddaddy was opposed for the Democratic nomination for congressman from his district by Richmond Pearson Hobson. Hobson was the young naval lieutenant who volunteered to sink the Collier Merrimack across the channel of the harbor at Santiago de Cuba, thus preclude the escape of Cervera's fleet. He did sink it, but was taken prisoner. His coup caught the imagination of the entire country, even though the strategy failed. The Spanish fleet streamed out to be annihilated, but Hobson returned a hero. He added to his popularity by kissing every woman and baby he met. Grandfather was the victim of these dramatics, but he did not pine in defeat. The following year, he was elected to a seat in the United States Senate, remained there until his death. Here's the payoff. Daddy was defeated in his first campaign for congressman, but on the second try, the Bankheads had plotted a new congressional district in the meantime, was elected. Whom did he beat? 
Richmond Pearson Hobson. I can't work myself up into a lather about family trees. If you prowl back far enough, you're sure to run into something unpleasant. But experts swear that John Hollis Bankhead, that's grandfather, was a direct descendant of Lieutenant John Hollis, aide to George Washington, the son of one of grandfather's ancestors married Thomas Jefferson's granddaughter. I've been told that the name Bankhead pops up on at least one tombstone in Monticello. Neither sister nor I had any silver spoon handicaps. Daddy never made much money either as a lawyer or government servant. He had no instinct for business. Granddaddy, too, was inept in money matters. He once had the controlling interest in Coca-Cola. He sold out to invest in Cherry Cola. The less said about that maneuver, the better. He had once owned the Bankhead and Caledonia coal mines of Bankhead, Alabama, and sold them for a cool million. There was little of this loot lying around on my first entrance. Granddaddy loathed anything ostentatious. Paradoxically, I was his favorite granddaughter. When he was in the Senate, Grandmother drove about in her own car with a liveried chauffeur. Granddaddy scorned such nonsense. He rode to the Capitol in a streetcar. He never rose in the Senate to speak unless the subject was close to his heart. He was the father of federal good roads. There's a monument in Washington testifying to this. It bears a sundial. On one side is engraved the name of Lincoln, on the other that of John Hollis Bankhead. The Bankhead Highway runs from Washington through the Deep South and out to the far west. Granddaddy was the last Confederate veteran in the Senate. In the war between the states, he recruited his own regiment. He was wounded eight times and was a captain at 18. A measure came up in the Senate in 1916 for an appropriation for a bust of General Robert E. Lee. There was no great enthusiasm for the proposal. Debate on the subject dawdled. Granddaddy sat through this silently. Then he thought of a way to focus attention on his resentment. He rose one morning, put on his Confederate uniform, donned his sword, then proceeded to the Capitol by streetcar. Taking his seat on the floor, he remained silent, mute accuser of those lacking in respect to his hero, Robert E. Lee. During his wordless accusation, Marshal Joffrey and Rene Viviani of France, here to seek American support in their struggle with the Germans, addressed the joint houses of Congress. Sister and I were in the gallery. We were able to understand something of Viviani's speech because of our French studies in the convents. Viviani's address over, the congressmen, the ambassadors, the Supreme Court justices filed by to greet the distinguished visitors. When Granddaddy reached out his hand to Viviani, everyone in the gallery, everyone on the floor, rose to their feet and cheered, many with tears streaming down their cheeks. A week later, the newspapers carried the story that Senator Bankhead of Alabama had shamed the Senate into voting the appropriation through his silent protest. It was Granddaddy who broke the voting deadlock at the 1916 Democratic National Convention in St. Louis by casting Alabama's 24 votes for Woodrow Wilson. At that same convention, Daddy had made the speech nominating Oscar Underwood, junior senator from Alabama, for the presidency. Granddaddy was an opposing figure, six feet three inches. Because of a facial likeness, he was often mistaken for William Jennings Bryan. He was opinionated, stubborn. When General Pershing led a parade down Pennsylvania Avenue before World War I, Granddaddy wouldn't get up from his chair to look out the window. Pershing, he said, was a show-off. I'd better scramble back to my childhood. I might get in trouble talking about show-offs. Daddy couldn't cope with sister and me when my grandparents were in Washington. We would live with Aunt Marie in Montgomery so long as Congress was in session, usually from September to June. Aunt Marie pampered us, humored, humored us. She sent us to Miss Gussie Woodruff's school for girls to still another school run by Miss Margaret Booth. And I went on public school in Jasper for two terms. Aunt Marie is the most durable as well as the most delightful of the bankheads. Now 82 and weighing 220 pounds, she was spry as a cricket when she spent last Thanksgiving at my home in a reunion that embraced Uncle Henry. She succeeded her deceased husband, Thomas M. Owen, as archivist of the state of Alabama. To prove she was qualified for the job, Aunt Marie tossed off an eight-volume history of the state. She has written three novels, and as recently as 1945, submitted a three-act play to the Theater Guild. The Marble Memorial Building in, Mon in Montgomery is a tribute to her determination. Jokingly, she told me she demanded the new memorial building that she might have a toilet in her office. In her old quarters at the Capitol, she had to walk 30 feet down a hall. The memorial required a federal appropriation of a million dollars. 
Aunt Marie badgered Governor Graves into going to Washington and demanding this sum from Harry Hopkins. Hopkins demurred. He said he couldn't humor every old lady who wanted a million dollars. The governor reminded him that Aunt Marie's brother was Speaker of the House, another brother one of the ranking members of the Senate's Appropriation Committee. Hopkins saw the light. Aunt Marie got her million for her toilet. So busy was Aunt Marie with official duties, she didn't have a chance to see me act until I impersonated Cleopatra in Shakespeare's salute to that minx. When the critics flayed me, she gave me a pep talk. Those jackasses, those jackasses, don't pay any attention to what they say. You go down to the theater tonight and give the best performance of your life. Remember how your grandfather acted when Hobson de defeated him in Congress? When I was luxuriating in The Little Foxes in 1939, Aunt Marie saw me act for the second time. I was riding high and Aunt Marie rejoiced. I showed her the town. Headed back to Jasper two weeks later, she said, I've seen Tallulah and the Little Foxes. I've seen the World's Fair and I've seen a fight at the Stork Club. Now I can go home and tell them I've seen everything. Aunt Marie has lived for more than 50 years in that house in Montgomery where I spent so many happy days. Only four years ago, she paid off the mortgage. Up to a few years ago, she commuted to her little farm at Wetumpka in a rattletrap car held together with paper clips and rubber bands. One day she was rammed by a truck, went to the hospital with a split tongue and a broken kneecap. Muted by the accident, she motioned to an attendant for pencil and paper. To hell with the kneecap, doctor, she wrote, but a bankhead without a tongue is no good to the state of Alabama. It was from Aunt Marie that I learned of the early education of her brothers, Daddy, Uncle John, and Uncle Henry. Their tutor was Old Jenkins. Old Jenkins had quite a history. The legend ran that he was a Carolina blue blood who had fled Charleston after drilling a neighbor with his pistol. In his wanderings, this well-heeled fugitive met and married an Indian squaw. He found life in a blanket satisfying, didn't return to Charleston until word reached him that his father had died. If he wanted to share in the loot left by his old man, he'd better come home. Telling his squaw he'd be back in three moons, he canoed away to collect. The law's delay appended him. It was six months before he got back to the reservation. The chief told him his wife had died of a broken heart, whereupon our homicidal brave went back to Charleston to brood. He was still brooding when he read an advertisement Granddaddy had inserted in the newspaper. Granddaddy sought an engineer to operate his sawmill at Fayette. The morose widower took the job, but upset Granddaddy because he refused to eat at the same table with the fashion. When addressed, he spoke in Indian. Taciturn, sullen, old Jenkins had one bent which distinguished him from everyone else in Alabama. He was a subscriber to the London Times. He read each of the three-week-old issues to Granddaddy's sons on its arrival. That's why they knew more about Disraeli and Victoria than they knew about James G. Blaine and James Garfield back in the early 1880s. Old Jenkins must have been the forerunner of those boys who have been making such a good thing of reading George Bernard Shaw and Charles Dickens to our peasants at $4.80 a seat. He was born too soon. It's reasonable to think Aunt Marie welcomed a Germans in Congress. She lost no time in getting us back to Jasper once Granddaddy returned from Washington. There we'd be clapped in Miss Bessie Howe's kindergarten. When it collapsed for lack of customers, Daddy persuaded Miss Hawes to live with us and continue teaching. She became my Aunt Bessie. I was 10, sister 11, before we ever got out of Alabama. In 1912, Aunt Louise was living in New York, so sister and I were entered at the Academy of the Sacred Heart up near City College. Now that I've conceded the year of my birth, I'll confirm it with a date. January 31st, two years to the day after mother and daddy were married. Teddy Roosevelt was in the White House and Leo the 13th in the Vatican. It was the year that Mount Pele erupted and wiped out the town of St. Pierre Martinique. I cite this calamity that I may add this extension. On seeing me in private lives, critic John Mason Brown wrote, I was the only volcano ever dressed by a Mount Boucher. January 31st, that makes me an Aquarian. I've never dug very deep in astrology. I know more about Harz Mountain's canaries than I do about horoscopes, even if I did part with $50 to have Evangeline Adams survey my future. According to Evangeline, you'll find it in her book, Astrology, Your Place in the Sun. Aquarians are calm, serene, temperate. They're careful of their money. I could have saved Evangeline a lot of embarrassment had I been born three months earlier. That would have made me a scorpion. As a scorpion, I would have fitted into her astral calculations. An Aquarian in the skin of a scorpion. For years, critics have been prodding me to play Hedda Gabler. 
Quite a rip, that Norwegian, just between us. I think Hedda would be my cup of tea. After a year at Sacred Heart, Sister and I were sent to Mary Baldwin Academy in Staunton, Virginia, where my grandparents could keep an eye on us. Our cousin Marion, Uncle John's eldest daughter, was there, as was the daughter of Senator Carter Glass of Virginia. Weekends, we were permitted to visit the home of neighbor Cordell Hull, even ride his Shetland ponies. After a half term at Mary Baldwin, we were transferred to the convent of the Visitation in Washington, present site of the Mayflower Hotel. After a term and a half there, we were enrolled at the convent of the Holy Cross. A year later, I would be making my last academic stand at Fairmount Seminary, Washington. In all these schools, I scuffled with the violin and the piano. I read screen magazines to the exclusion of almost everything else. The sultry lives, the shady pasts of the actors fascinated me. They were my heroines. Daddy, graduate of two colleges, used to say, if you know your Bible, Shakespeare, and can shoot craps, you have a liberal education. To me, he was a fusion of Santa Claus, Galahad, D'Artagnan, and Demosthenes. He was the gallant, the romantic, the poet, above all, the actor. I can still quote yards of verse just from hearing him recite Hiawatha, Little Orphan Annie, The Spell of the Yukon, Cardinal Wolseley crying out, Had I but served my God with half the zeal I served my king, he would not in my age have left me naked to mine enemies. When he launched into, for God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings, he was Shakespeare's Richard II. His stories of Samson and Delilah, of Desdemona and Othello, were as exciting as the perils of Pauline. He never read the Bible to us. He would tell us biblical tales in his own words. He believed the whale swallowed Jonah and never wavered in his faith. It's strange that I can remember so much of the poetry he quoted, the plots he highlighted, when I can't remember a date, a telephone number, an address. I have no sense of direction. I can't tell left from right, except politically. Things and places have to be pointed out to me. No blueprint will aid me. When I bought my first car in London, I had to hire a cab to precede me to my destination. Alone, through little, though littered with instructions, I was helpless. I learned most of what I know from Daddy. In oral examinations, I could talk my way into the clear, hoodwink the teachers. In written tests, I was a washout. My tongue worked faster than my pen. Other solutions have been offered, which I will not go into here. No use giving aid and comfort to the enemy. No Sunday passed in Jasper that Daddy didn't tell us a story from the Bible. He'd reduce us to, the, to tears with the ordeal of Lot and his wife, then calm us by promising the story of Job a week later. When we were at Sacred Heart, one of the nuns derailed us with Dickens' Tale of Two Cities. She told it beautifully. beautifully. When she got to Sidney Curtin's "'Tis a far, far better thing I do," we were sobbing. She had told us the story in installments and built up such suspense. Sister and I could hardly sleep between chapters. Of the eight schools I attended in ten years, I liked Sacred Heart best. Although Sister and I were there but a year, I became fairly fluent in French. I even learned to sew. That year at Sacred Heart was memorable for another reason. At Christmas, Daddy came up to visit us. He bought us presents, little gold watches hitched to elastic wristbands. But he had a greater treat for us. He took us to see The Whip at the Manhattan Opera House. The Whip was a blood and thunder melodrama in four acts and 14 scenes imported from London's Drury Lane Theater. It boiled with villainy and violence. Its plot embraced a 12 horse race on a treadmill, a hunt breakfast embellished by 15 dogs on stage, an auto smash up, the chamber of horrors at Madame Tussaud's waxworks, and a train wreck with a locomotive hissing real steam on stage. It boasted a dissolute earl and a wicked marquis, and a heroine whose hand was sought by both knave and hero. It was a tremendous emotional dose for anyone as impressionable and as stage struck as your correspondent. The curtain hadn't been up five minutes before Sister and I were on the verge of hysterics. By the end of the first act, both of us had wet our pants. Daddy's suggestion that we retire to the ladies' room for the treatment was, ex was scorned. When the careening car smashed into the bridge at the start of the second act, we became so overwrought, Daddy had to hang onto our collars to keep us from tumbling out of the box. At the final curtain, I was a wreck, frantic, red-eyed, and disheveled. I didn't sleep for two nights running. When I did, the treacherous Marquis intruded on my dreams. Nothing I had ever seen or heard or read had made such an impact on me. 
I've often wondered why Daddy elected to see the whip. There were politer and gentler plays in New York at the time. As holiday bait for children, Maud Adams was playing in Peter Pan at the Empire. Why did Daddy scorn Sir J.M. Barry's whimsy? I suspect he wanted to see the whip revel in its spectacular furies, its scenic wonders, its mob scenes. He may have felt that since I was stage struck, he might as well give me the full dramatic treatment. I was exposed to the whip just short of 40 years ago. I've never recovered. Where else can you see 12 thoroughbreds racing neck and neck on a treadmill? Remember, this was the first play I had ever seen anywhere. Later that winter, Aunt Louise wrangled a special dispensation from the, dun from the nuns. She took us to a matinee of The Good Little Devil. This was a gentle fairy tale staged and produced by David Velasco, he of the clerical collar and the hypnotic manner. The Good Little Devil lacked the emotional fevers of the whip, but it too left its mark. Although five years would elapse before I would face a New York audience, I felt dedicated. Over that span, I fretted and fumed. I might survive my martyrdom, but I'd never condone it. Just for the record, there were two young ladies in the cast of The Good Little Devil who later would create quite a commotion on our screens, Mary Pickford and Lillian Gish. Daddy used to call me Dutch because I was fat. He called sister Kildee. The bird watchers in the audience will know why. The Kildee is a small plover, so named for its plaintive cry. Sister was skinny and sickly. She was the favorite of Daddy and Aunt Marie. I was sickly too, but got little sympathy because I was fat. Into six years, I crowded whooping cough, measles, pneumonia, the mumps, crew, tonsillitis, even smallpox. All of these focused in my throat and chest. That's one of the reasons for my deep voice. Though sister's ills couldn't match mine, one of them took a more serious turn. When two, she had measles and whooping cough at the same time. Left in a sun-flooded room, she became blind. She had to play at night and sleep in the daytime. Finally, she was taken off on a pillow to Washington to see Dr. Wilmer, the specialist who later operated on the King of Siam. Dr. Wilmer saved sister's sight. Sensitive to the dramatic, I envied her, pillo her pillow exit. To deny me anything only inflames my desire. One of the first recollections is of my rage and shame when daddy took sister off on a picnic, left me behind. I flung myself on the floor, got purple in the face, and screamed blue murder. Grandmother had a solution. She threw a bucket of water in my face. This cooled me off, but I was never to forget being left behind. Psychiatrists will now surge to their feet and shout that from this incident flowered my notion that I was unwanted. I deny this, but there's no denying I smoldered for years over this snub. Daddy didn't always leave me behind. Let me cite my passport to London in 1923. In the blank following distinguishing marks, I wrote Snakebite. This was the product of a picnic I did go on, along with sister and a lot of other youngsters. We were looking for dogwood when a whirring noise in the grass fascinated me. Look, Daddy, look, I cried as I leaned over to find out the cause of the disturbance. Then the rattler fanged me in the thigh. Quick as a flash, Daddy snatched off my pants and sucked the blood from the wound. Subsequently, he was quite ill. He had an abrasion in his gums, and the poison infected him. If Sister was the favorite of Daddy and Aunt Marie because of her smallness, her beauty, and her illnesses, I was the pet of Granddaddy and Grandmother. They lavished affection on me, humored me beyond reason, were tolerant of my tantrums. Grandmother, once she had discovered the anecdote, was not above sloshing me down with water when I went berserk. She was no woman to shrink from a remedy once its potency was established. I've mentioned sister's beauty. There's no denying that I was the ugly duckling, thanks to my fat and my pimples. Sister was the top bankhead girl until I got into the theater. She liked to dance and swim and ride. She was an excellent student. I was an indifferent one. Sister was the party girl. I was the homebody. She liked to be up at the crack of dawn. I liked to lie in bed and meditate on the future. I would grow furious when awakened to pin up sister's hair. I loathed parties. I had a preference for the mirror. It was sister who won the Tre Bien at the Sacred Heart Convent, reward for consistent good conduct and good marks, which entitled the recipient to wear a blue sash for a month. I could never win a Tre Bien. My conduct was off-key. When thwarted, I resorted to biting, a form of mayhem not encouraged by the nuns. Sister was mouse-like. She copped three Tre Bien in a row. When denied a fourth, I was so outraged I picked up, I picked up an inkwell and hurled it against the wall. My best friend at Sacred Heart was Linda Lee Wallace, great-granddaughter of Robert E. Lee. 
She's the niece of Cole Porter's wife, if that theatrical interruption doesn't seem too contrived. At the exercises at the end of the term, the more well-behaved girls wore white veils and carried white lilies. I was an outlaw in the procession in a short black veil and without a lily, the penalty for misconduct. I felt like an untouchable. We paraded down a long corridor into the chapel. When I looked up and saw Daddy and Aunt Louise, I broke down and bawled. Daddy went to the mother superior and said, Sister, I'm sorry. I'm afraid my girls are a little too young for the convent. Though sister excelled me in school and got along better with our teachers, I wasn't jealous, although we fought constantly. When I entered Holy Cross Convent, sister was ill. For the first time, I was on my own. Because of her early blindness, we had started school together, always had been in the same classes. Daddy accompanied me on my first day at Holy Cross. As he was about to leave, I started to bawl, Don't leave! Don't leave me! On his departure, I kept right on wailing. One of the required studies at Holy Cross was Latin. My tears kept me from concentrating on this baffling tongue. This led to a lot of confusion. The nuns got the impression that the Garoons and Garundives caused my tears. My tears were due to separation from sister. My squalls had lasted a month when daddy withdrew me. He arranged me for stay with friends until sister recovered. I put on 10 pounds thanks to my capacity for popovers and was permitted to go to the movies. Then accompanied by sister, I went back to Holy Cross. For the rest of my stay there, I shed not a tear. At the University of Alabama, Daddy had been president of his class in 1893, had won his Phi Beta Kappa Key. Once he had his law degree from Georgetown University, he briefly practiced in Huntsville. Then, with two fellow Alabamans, he challenged New York. The trio set up a brokerage office called, oddly enough, the Atlantic Charter. An entry in his journal, dated January 3, 1898, reads, My life in New York has been more of a struggle than I have heretofore known. We have had some hard cuffs. We have stood on powder mines and squeezed through tight places by the score. There have been times in our business when the end of the rope seemed at hand, when the camel's back seemed about to pop. And yet, by the grace of God, we have withstood the tempest, still look men fair in the face. A day later, the entry started. I expect to attend the Wednesday cotillion tonight at Sherry's. Ended with, I doubt whether I shall go to this affair or not. I have no gloves. As vital to Daddy as food and drink was a forum, a stage, a pulpit, a skilled conversationalist, a born storyteller, a gentleman who rejoiced in rolling sentences and Rococo rhetoric, he could have been another Edwin Booth. His profile was not unlike Booth's. Another Billy Sunday, another William Jennings Bryan. He might even have been a dramatic critic. His journal has, ma has many pithy comments on plays he saw in New York. Do you see why daddy was my hero, my beau ideal? Year, years later, when I was in Washington with a play and daddy was speaker of the house, he drove me to the stage door one night. As we parted, he said, oh, Tallulah, if I had only had one whack of it. My education, thanks to daddy's thirst for drama, his devotion to the classics, his preoccupation with poetry and his gifts as a storyteller, he instilled in me a desire to ape him. I developed an itch to read, if not to study. The first book to make an impression on me was Grimm's Fairy Tales. I was a sponge for Shakespeare's poetry. It wasn't long before I was spouting, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore out there Romeo? Though knowest the mask of night is on my face, else would a maiden blush. And friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I came to bury Caesar, not to praise him. I'd like to interrupt this monologue to say I've never had the urge to impersonate Juliet. I'm as, as fascinated as the next woman with the romance that jarred the Montagues and the Capulets, but I've always thought it a little sacrilegious for a 40-year-old actress to try to carry on like a 16-year-old girl. Juliet is a contradiction. In Shakespeare's romantic tragedy, she's just a child. But what child knows enough about Shakespeare or his verse or about acting to attempt the role at 16 or at 26? Granted great acting skill, long experience, familiarity with the bard's poetry and meaning, by the time an actress is capable of trying Juliet, she's disqualified by the mirror. I was a sucker for Rupert Brooke. I ran a temperature over Baudelaire. Was it Andre Marat or one of the Zvigs who so vividly wrote the scene in which John Knox and the aroused Scots at Holyrood screamed up to Mary Stewart's castle window, harlot, harlot, harlot. Her reply still electrifies me. 
pupil of Roussain, Queen of France, Queen of Scotland, Queen of England. Daddy not only quoted poetry at the drop of a hat, he wrote it. He recited little breeches so often, I thought he was its author. I could rattle it off in my sleep. Back in the 30s, I had a great crush on Jock Whitney. I was boasting to him of Daddy's poetry, cited among his accomplishments, little breeches. Are you sure your father wrote it? Said Jock, positive. Want to bet? I certainly will bet. Come with me, said Jock. I want to show you something. We drove to his boathouse in Long Island. There he took a book and pointed out little breeches. Alas, the author was John Hay. Was I embarrassed? John Hay had been Abraham Lincoln's secretary. He was the grandfather of John Hay Whitney. John Hay Whitney was Jock. Jock had caught me with my quotes down. Why, someone may ask, were sister and I sent to Catholic convents? None of the bankheads were Catholic. Daddy was a Methodist and a regular churchgoer. He said grace before each meal. Grandmother was a devout Presbyterian, but every Sunday sister and I attended ser services at the little Episcopal chapel set up in a loft over a seed store. We had to climb up rickety stairs, masked in with faded cheesecloth in the interests of dignity. This was on Daddy's insistence. Mother had been an Episcopalian, and in tribute to her memory and wishes, he felt we should be raised in her faith. When it became necessary to send us away to school, Daddy, my aunts, and Grandmother, despite their conflicting faiths, agreed that we'd fare best under the care and instruction of nuns. There were few schools in the South prepared to care for children so young as we were. I suspect, too, that Daddy felt the teaching in the convents would most closely approximate what Mother would have teached, taught us that he was aware of the long affinity of Catholicism and the Episcopal faith. Daddy had no talent for imposing discipline. That was a woman's work. He bribed us to go to bed with promises of Cracker Jack and candy. I knew when I incurred his displeasure. Then he would address me as Tallulah rather than Dutch or Sugar. Even as a child, I had a throaty laugh, vibrant and penetrating. On that tonsil trip to Birmingham, Daddy took me to the Tutwiler Hotel for lunch. He told me an amusing story, whereupon I let loose a hoarse guffaw. Every head came up, every eye was on me. Don't laugh so loud, he warned. Never make yourself conspicuous. It's bad form, bad manners. Three years ago, I had an echo of that warning. In the mail came a letter which read, Dear Miss Bankhead, in the name of Southern womanhood, can't you do something about that god-awful laugh of yours? Daddy loathed profanity. I never heard him curse. His notion of an epithet was jackass. Never take the name of the Lord in vain, he would say when I would rip out a goddamn. I might reply, reply I'm sorry, Daddy, but goddamn it. Then he would laugh. In my living room, there rests my, my mother's Bible. When he gave it to me, Daddy wrote on the flyleaf, as a spiritual source at the end of each exacting day, may I recommend to you your little mother's favorite, the 103rd Psalm. While I have never gone to church, since I could avoid it without penalty, I have found consolation in the Bible. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. I saw little of Daddy in the last twenty years of his life. We rarely corresponded. A letter from me is a collector's item. My secretary answers my urgent mail, but a telegram is about the limit of my correspondence. My telephone bills are hair-raising. There was another reason why Daddy was thwarted in one of his elections after 1917. It was claimed he was too devoted to the bottle. Although it may dismay some of the bankheads, I must admit this charge to a degree was true. It was a lapse he was quick to correct. Through the last 25 years of his life, Daddy drank sparingly, but he never became a teeto teetotaler. I loved to charge about with Daddy when he was campaigning. It made me feel important. I would, re I would clamber into a buggy with him and drive off to a picnic, a barbecue, a church social, or a rally in a schoolhouse. Here he would harangue the voters, point out flaws in his opponents. He pulled out all the stops. He brought into play his tricks, his fund of fo funny stories, his quotations. The campaigns were theatrical before an ever-changing audience. Once Daddy went to a small schoolhouse to address 50 farmers. To his dismay, only five showed up. I'll speak to you for only a few minutes since I have a long schedule, he started, 
Quickly, he realized that to dismiss them so casually was unprofessional, so he spoke for three hours. Later, later he told me this had been one of his finest efforts. Those five farmers could have elected me, he used to say. When I left, they were my champions, campaigners for Will Bankhead. I'm pleased to think I soaked up Daddy's campaigning integrity. I try to give as good a performance to an empty house as to a first night. Unlike my sire, I've never tossed off a performance in a theater other than the one for which I was scheduled. I've given unscheduled performances, but not in a theater. For all my involvements with politics and politicians, I've never thought of seeking office. Once in London, on the brink of marrying Anthony de Bosdery, I told a newspaperman, my ambition is to reverse the performance of Lady Astor. She is an American woman who got elected to the English House of Commons. I will shortly become an Englishwoman through my marriage to Anthony de Bosdari. Then I will try to capture a seat in the American Congress. This will be possible because I will retain my American citizenship rights. It must have been something I ate. 